If you're a parent like me, then you know how crucial bedtime routines are. And the last thing I need to interrupt my family's sleep is a leaky diaper. When I put the Pampers Cruisers 360 on my daughters overnight, I would be confident the diaper woes were not getting between me and the whole house getting a full night's rest. Pampers Cruisers 360 keeps wetness away from skin for up to 12 hours and provide up to 100% leak-proof fit, which means you won't be awake in the middle of the night trying to calm an unhappy kiddo or cleaning up any midnight messes. The thing is, Pampers are known for their great, dependable quality. They are easy to use with 360 stretchy waistband you can pull right up on your little wiggly one and easy tear sides, which means you can rip, wrap, and roll the diaper to dispose. Pampers are also hypoallergenic, free of elemental chlorine bleaching, parabens, and latex. Your baby deserves that. Having a diaper you can depend on is important, and it's why I've always loved Pampers. Download the Pampers Club app today to start earning rewards with every diaper and wipes purchase. Not to mention, get free diapers and great parenting content with Pampers Club. Grace Ramirez lives her life in quantum years. She spent the early part of her career in production before trying her hand in front of the camera as a cooking show contestant. She got her butt kicked. And instead of slinking away, doubled down by earning a scholarship to go to culinary school. From there, her career took off, and with it, her marriage unraveled. Grace moved through her own pain by helping others parachuting into Puerto Rico to provide meals for those impacted by Hurricane Maria the type of service that would come to define the next chapter of Grace's life. We talk about how chefs do not wait to be invited, they take their knives and go, the identity crisis that led Grace to learn to hunt, and her effort to bring nourishing Latin cuisine to students across this country. Grace, thank you so much for doing this. No, thank you. I've been looking forward for this for so long. Grace, you are born in Miami, raised in Venezuela, and so often I hear that story in reverse. Why was it that you were born in Miami and then raised in Venezuela? You know, it was the 80s, and my grandparents had a an apartment in Miami. And, you know, it was very typical for Venezuelans back then to have a second home in Miami. My mother was very, very smart, is very, very smart. And she had a scholarship to go to London. She didn't like it. She said it was too cold. So then my grandparents said, why don't you go to Miami and study in Miami instead? It's closer to us. It's warmer climate. And I was born there. My grandparents basically raised me because when I was a year old, my father had passed away and my mom was a working mom. My grandfather is a very interesting character in my life. He was a general in the Venezuelan Air Force. So, you know, he would fly from Caracas to Miami literally every week on a Hercules. And I remember literally growing up in that cabin of that airplane. When you lose a parent that young before you ever really know them, and then you're raised by a mom who's trying to figure things out in real time, what were the expectations of you? What was communicated to you as a child? I now look back and it all comes from that. You know, my my drive, my overachieving, it comes from a space that I wanted my mom to see me. You know, I wanted my mom to acknowledge my existence. I had to work on the relationship with my mom for a lot because the relationship with my mom was complicated. But I now look back and say, of course, my mom had a high school sweetheart that she had a child with and it was in her 20s who passed on Christmas Eve, very tragic car accident. And I was a year old. So imagine, you know, I look back and I'm who can blame her? She was trying to figure herself out. And then she had this hypersensitive child. I was like the sunshine of my family. But my mom was very tough on me and she was constantly wanting to give me a father. She was in search of a partner and a father for me, but not necessarily she was seeing me. So I was always like, look at me, you know, and being overachieving everything. Now that I look back, that says a lot of who I am today. And thank God I healed the relationship with mother. No, we get along great, but it was very difficult for a very long time. 
that desire to succeed, to be seen, it does take you to a lot of interesting places in your life. Again, the same way I say people are born in Venezuela and then usually move to Miami. Normally, I hear about people who start their career in culinary and end up in television. Again, for you, the reverse. And you start your career in television in Latin America. You're doing PA work, right? I was a PA since I was 16 with Miguel Angel Alonso. He's an amazing photographer. He ran a very famous agency at the time that he would do photography and he would do promos. I was a child model, but I was also helping out in that studio. So then I went from Miguel Angel Alonso's studio to working at Nickelodeon Latam, to then working at MTV, to then leaving Miami and then coming to New York to launch MTV Tres for Hispanics in the U.S. So by the time I was 24, I was supervising artist-related specials. So I got to interview, you know, from Jennifer Lopez to Beyonce to Ricky Martin to Shakira to everyone that was someone at the time and that is still relevant. So I felt very lucky to have had that kind of media experience. I've had many lives, as you know, but I think going from a director-producer role to then going to culinary school has been one of the biggest transitions for me to starting over. Well, especially because it doesn't happen in a totally linear way, right? Yeah, I, I had to start kind of over again in that transition of being kind of a supervising producer role for MTV to then literally quitting. I had done almost a decade at MTV, so I had enough, you know? And then there was this channel that started becoming really cool called The Food Network. And I didn't know anyone at The Food Network. I ran out of my savings because I was asking around who knew someone at the Food Network until at a party, my ex-partner said to me, oh, I found a lead. I found a person who knows someone that works for Bobby Flay's production company, Rock Shrimp. I was like, hook me up. And I was very persistent, like I normally am, very intense and intentional. And I finally got a meeting and I became an associate producer, which is obviously like four levels down from what I was doing at MTV3. But I didn't care. I just wanted to get my foot in the door and work at this network. And so I started as an associate producer. And then I became the director of the show, Throw It On With Bobby Flay. Until then, I left to do MasterChef, the first MasterChef ever. I went and cast it out of 60,000 people. They picked me. I sucked at it. I got kicked out on second episode, cried a lot, ate a lot of ice cream, thought my life was over. <laughs> and But, you know, Gordon Ramsay, when I was leaving, he said to me, he goes, you know what? you should come back after you do culinary school because you definitely have the passion for it. And I said, well, I'm never doing this show again, but you're right. And David Chang cookbook said he did culinary school at the French Culinary Institute in New York City and that it took him nine months. And I was like, oh, okay, women have children in nine months. I can give birth to culinary school in nine months. I'll go and check it out. But it was like $50,000. And I was like, how am I going to pay for this? Like, this is insane. I'm still paying for my first career and I cannot afford $50,000. But they said, well, we give two scholarships a year. So I said, oh, okay, well, I'll go win that scholarship then. And I did. That's how I went to culinary school. If you're a mom like me, you know how crucial bedtime routines are. And the last thing I need to interrupt my family's sleep is a leaky diaper. When I put the Pampers Cruisers 360 on my daughter's overnight, I would be confident that diaper woes were not getting between me and the whole house getting a full night's rest. Pampers Cruisers 360 keep wetness away from the skin for up to 12 hours and provide up to 100% leak-proof fit, which means you will not be awake in the middle of the night trying to calm an unhappy kiddo or cleaning up any midnight messes. The thing is, Pampers are known for their great dependable quality. They are easy to use with those 360 stretchy waistbands you can pull right up on your little wiggly one, and easy tear sides, which means you can rip, wrap, and roll the diaper to dispose. Pampers are also hypoallergenic, free of elemental chlorine bleaching, parabens, and latex. Your baby deserves that. Having a diaper you can depend on is important, and it's why I've always loved Pampers. Download the Pampers Club app today to start earning rewards with every diaper and wipes purchase. Not to mention, you can get free diapers and great parenting content with Pampers Club. What if I told you the country's largest anti-hunger program is working against the children it's supposed to serve? Leftover, a new original podcast from LWC Studios is a deep dive investigation into America's national school lunch program. I'm Jessica Terrell, an award-winning journalist, and over the last two years, I've been investigating what's broken in the school lunch system. Leftover uncovers how corporations and politicians are milking the American school lunch. Subscribe, follow, and listen to the entire Leftover series wherever you get your favorite podcasts. 
Hi, everybody. Juleka here. I want to tell you about a show we've been listening to. It's called The Pulso Podcast. You know, there are a lot of shows that cover Latino culture and news, like our show. But Pulso uses the through line of history to provide more context and nuance to our stories. Like, did you know that there's an official Spanish version of the Star-Spangled Banner? Or that a team of Mexican lawyers changed the future of segregation laws in the 50s? The Pulso Podcast is a Latina-hosted, Latina-produced show that explores untold stories and unheard voices shaping the experiences of nuestra gente. To hear more, listen and subscribe to the Pulso Podcast wherever you listen to our show. Hindsight being 2020, of course, it makes sense that a person who has the type of grounding you have in media, and then you add the culinary degree, that your television career in this space explodes. Yeah, you know, it was very intentional, honestly. In Venezuela, you could only work in front of the camera if you were Miss Venezuela. So now it all makes sense. I was a child model until I was 16. And at 16, I got taken to that guy who tells the Miss Venezuelas, you could be Miss Venezuela or you could not be Miss Venezuela. And he said, I wasn't tall enough. I wasn't pretty enough. I wasn't skinny enough. I wasn't enough, enough, enough to be a Miss Venezuela. That really traumatized me. And I was like, well, if I cannot be Miss Venezuela, then I can't be in front of the camera. But I could be an amazing producer, director. But inside, I always wanted to be in front of the camera because that's what I was doing. I was like this child model. But then when I found the kitchen, I was like, wait a minute. Now it all makes sense. It's showing off my culture. It's showing off something that I love doing. And I remember having this conversation with Bobby Flay. Bobby said to me, go be the J-Lo of cooking. <laughs> Which I thought was really funny. But I took that, like, just go do it, you know? Coming from him and coming from Jennifer, when the last time I interviewed her, Jennifer Lopez, she said to me, we are the new American girl. The only thing that I'm going to tell you is don't let anyone put you in a box. Don't let the stereotypes get you. And to have come from that, I can be in front of the camera to have these two very successful individuals, Bobby Flay and Jennifer Lopez said to me, go do you. You are the new American girl. I had a huge impact in my career. As your television career explodes, what happens to your marriage? It was hard because... Antonio is an amazing human being who have taught me so much. And now we're in a great space of, of this very deep friendship and mutual respect for each other. But there was something about our marriage. First of all, Antonio's older than me and our dynamic, now that we look back, it was kind of me just admiring him and him admiring me, but not in an equal way. And he was very supportive of me. But I think that, you know, it's hard. Like I was exploding. I was, I became New Zealand's sweetheart. I was in all the newspaper. I was in all the covers. I launched my first cookbook. I was a judge for My Kitchen Rules. And looking back, like, I think that would have made me insecure as well. And it was hard. It was, I think we both failed at, at prioritizing the marriage. Thank God we went to couples therapy to get divorced because it was the best thing that we could have done, the most mature thing that we could have done for ourselves and each other. I think we both learned from the many mistakes we did and we're applying it into our, our new relationships, which we're very grateful for. I ask you about that because it is an inflection point, again, in your own life, where while well, you have this activist and advocate spirit, it's sort of in the depths of your own pain that you really find purpose and clarity about the way in which you want to use the skills that you have built in the service of others. If you are comfortable, can you sort of take me back to that period of time as your marriage is falling apart, as you are in the depths of that divorce and the decision you make at that point? I appreciate talking about this because I think that people see me and they see my life and all they see is glam and glow and, and the TV shows and Grace speaking at Congress. And yes, I went through a depression, something that I never thought could ever happen. When my marriage fell apart, when I was divorcing Antonio, my grandmother passed exactly the same month when we decided to get divorced. And I have, I have had many passings. Like death is a constant in my life. 
And it's a constant reminder of the appreciation that I have of life and how I live my life. (laughs) My boyfriend now says that I live in quantum years. So it's true. I don't live a linear life. I live a full life every day. And I live a very present life. But in that moment, I was lost. And I didn't know that level of grief could get me into a depression. And then Maria happened, hurricane in Puerto Rico. And we saw that image of President Trump just throwing the bounty paper, toilet paper to the crowd. And I knew the work that Jose was doing. I went and tried to see Jose speak at the Food and Wine New York. And he was getting interviewed by Sam Cass, who's the former chef of the Obama administration. I went up to Sam. Jose was virtually in Puerto Rico. And I said, Sam, connect me to Jose. I need to go to Puerto Rico. He goes, no, just go show up. You know, we chefs, we just show up. Take your knives and go. I took the advice that Sam gave me and I took my knives and went to Puerto Rico. And then, of course, I met everyone who was working with Jose and just started cooking. I didn't shower for like two weeks. It was hard. But what Puerto Rico gave me was hope. It gave me life and it gave me purpose. And I realized that the only way to come out of this depression was two ways. Giving back to the community and really taking seriously that if I didn't stop and did this meditation center for six months, I just literally lock myself in a meditation center so I can grieve for six months because I have not stopped working as long as I can remember. I said, I need to take the time to heal and I need to take the time to mourn and I need to take the time to heal this relationship with my mother because it's preventing me from taking that leap of boom, you know, and that's and of everything exploding. And I think that that was a very specific turning point where I completely turned my life around. I decided to, I cannot keep living like this anymore. I felt like dying of grief at that point. So I, I needed to take it seriously. And I did. To your point about your life being nonlinear and living in quantum years, where in all of this do you face this question of who you are as a chef, your sort of identity crisis around being a chef? The identity crisis about being a chef came in right after culinary school because culinary school here in New York back then gave you a very strong set of skills. But where does food come from? Wait a minute. What part of the animal is this? Like you had a very superficial understanding of this, where food came from. And and I didn't think it was fair. I, I was facing an identity crisis as a chef. Like, what is my philosophy around food? Because I love meat, but I understand what it does for the planet. Where do I stand in this debate around sustainability and eating meat? My ex-husband said to me, look, I have a big job offering in New Zealand. I said, well, let's go. I mean, if there's a country that is all about sustainability, garden to table, philosophy, and is so ahead of its time when it comes to food, is New Zealand. In New Zealand, I decided to say, if I'm going to eat it, I'm going to own it. So if I'm going to eat meat, I want to see the whole process of how an animal gets slaughtered, and I'm going to work at a butcher shop. I'm going to go hunting with the boys for deer, and I'm going to go fishing. And I work at a garden to table program with kids where we taught kids how to grow, harvest, and cook their own food. So there, it was where my passion around sustainability and traceability came from. Now, you know, I think everything in moderation. I eat a very balanced diet. I eat meat only sometimes grass-fed. And if I go to a restaurant and eat meat, most of the times I know the chef and I know where it's coming from. And I know they're making a very ethical decision of where that meat is coming from. But that's when my strong food philosophy came from. It came 100% from living in New Zealand for four years. It strikes me, Grace, that you have so much going on and so many cool things happening that we could do separate episodes (laughs) on each thing. Because I love that when you and I were together at We All Grow, the thing you were most excited about, it seemed to me, was Cocina Latina. Tell me what it is and tell me why it means so much to you. La Latina Cocina is a concept that I, in conjunction with Aramark, Aramark runs like 250 higher education food halls around the country. And inside those food halls lives La Latina Cocina. So think of like a chipotle meets La Carreta, but really cool and trendy and 
specifically designed for kids in universities and colleges around the country. Very Latin food, right? But you have your rice, your beans, your shredded beef, your chicken tinga, your chipotle mushrooms, your tostadas, your tacos, your choripan, your wasacaca. So I think that seeing La Latina Cocina come to life, which is literally bringing my cookbook, La Latina, to life in 80 universities around the country have been a dream come true. But most importantly, the messages that I get from kids is like, I haven't had plantain since I left home from Puerto Rico. This tastes like my grandmother's food. I feel home when I eat your food. I feel nourished. I feel comforted. That to me is everything. For Latino kids to feel home and nurtured and for non-Latino kids to discover Latin flavors. And it's the first time we have proper representation in these spaces. And the concept has my name and my face on it because I wanted to make sure that Latina girls see me and they could dream and they could dream big because I've just had to work really, really hard. And having that bite of my grandmother's beans in 80 colleges around the country, that's a dream come true. I mean, I always said that I didn't want to own a restaurant because I'm all about impact and scale. Well, La Latina Cocina... (laughs) It's about impact and scale. I mean, I'm feeding thousands of kids a day. I'm very proud of that. And at the end of the day, it's about representation and how excited I am to break down a wall and make space for us. Grace, thank you so much. (laughs) Thank you, dear. I love you. Thanks for listening. Latina to Latina is executive produced and owned by Juleka Lantigua and me, Alicia Menendez. Paulina Velasco is our producer. Cochin Tashiro is our lead producer. Trent Lightburn mixed this episode. We love hearing from you. Email us at hola at latinatolatina.com. Slide into our DMs on Instagram or tweet us at Latina to Latina. Check out our merchandise at latinatolatina.com slash shop. And remember to subscribe or follow us on Radio Public, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Good Pods, wherever you're listening right now. Every time you share the podcast, every time you leave a review, you help us to grow as a community. 